Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our debate on digital identity, digital citizenship and e-government. Today's debate is hosted by Andrew Sansip, who needs no introduction. Uh, I'm sure you all know him uh, very well as former European Commissioner for the Digital Single Market and now as MEP with Renew Europe. He's vice chair of the IMCO committee and a member of the special committee on AI in a digital age of the European Parliament. Welcome and thank you very much for taking the lead on this debate at our forum. Today we will discuss uh, um, the European Commission's ambition to create a secure and interoperable European digital identity. And we will discuss also the upcoming review of the EIDAS regulation, providing a cross-border legal framework for electronic identification, authentication and website certification within the EU. We are joined by five speakers to discuss the drivers and barriers to the development and uptake of the electronic identification and the benefits for citizens and businesses. We will hear from them about the necessary features uh, for a trusted and secure European ID and about the EID solutions that are currently being developed in Europe. Let's give a warm welcome to our speakers, starting with Lorena Boix Alonso, Director for Digital Society, Trust and Cybersecurity at DigiConnect European Commission. Next up will be Oliver Vertno, uh, CEO of Cybernetica. We're also joined by Philippe Lucas, Executive Vice President, Customer Equipment and Partnership with Orange by Patrick von Brandmüll, Senior Director of Public Affairs with Bundesdruckerei. And last but not least, we'll be joined by Coti de Monteverde, Director at the Blockchain Center of Excellence at, of Santander. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, as usual, as you know, uh, after listening to our speakers, there will be an exchange of views with our audience, which will take place in the Q&A session, but we will guide you there later. Now, with uh, no further ado, it is my great pleasure to give the floor to our MEP, Andrus Ansip, and after him, to each uh, one of our speakers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, nobody is perfect enough to use its own example to teach others. Uh, but uh, today, we are celebrating our Independence Day in Estonia, and uh, for many people, Estonia is known as E-Estonia. If there is an E-Estonia success story, then it's also based on single uh, digital identities guaranteed by the governments. In Estonia, our digital identities uh, are based on smart ID cards. So everybody has that, that kind of card. We got our smart ID cards um, already in the year 2002. It was mandatory to have smart ID cards in Estonia. You can have your travel passport or not, uh, but you have to have your smart ID card. But in the very beginning, uh, uh, we didn't have so many possibilities to use uh, our smart ID cards uh, in a very smart way. It was uh, good to identify uh, yourself with uh, smart ID cards uh, uh, when crossing uh, the border uh, uh, when traveling to Finland. Uh, it was also comfortable to, to open envelopes with the smart ID cards uh, uh, and, and that's it. When we got our smart ID cards, we already, already had so-called X-Road system or a unified data exchange platform in Estonia, which allowed to cross-use information through different uh, databases. But uh, nevertheless, it took six years for Estonia uh, to collect our first one million uh, digital signatures. In the year 2007, we implemented so-called once-only principle on the level of the government. It means state has right to ask for the same information only once. Second time is prohibited. State has to remember and with my permission to use uh, this information uh, once again and uh, this implement implementation of uh, once only principle gave a real boost on usage of digital identities in estonia very soon estonians started to sign 
digitally 1.3 million times per week. And our population in Estonia is 1.3 million inhabitants. Now, people in Estonia are using digital identities everywhere uh, to submit your personal income tax declaration, to change your uh, driving license, to sign agreements, or even to get uh, results of your COVID-19 tests. We have even e-elections uh, in Estonia. In fact, uh, during our first uh, municipal elections uh, in the year 2005, only 10,000 people uh, voted uh, uh, electronically via the internet. But last time during our parliamentary elections, uh, we collected even 44% of uh, votes electronically. Many, many years ago, we figured out uh, that uh, just uh, uh, thanks to digital signatures, we were able to save one working week uh, in a year, which is equal to 2% of GDP, which is also equal to our defense uh, expenditures. So we can say uh, defense expenditures uh, uh, in Estonia are coming from digital signatures, from digital uh, identities. We have many uh, really good digital solutions in all EU uh, member states. And we have also the EIDS uh, relation, which allows mutual recognition of different digital identities. But nevertheless, uh, it's difficult to get cross-border access to those uh, excellent uh, digital uh, services. Well, uh, there are really good, uh, is a really good example, uh, uh, which is uh, the mutual recognition of uh, e-prescriptions between Finland and Estonia, but uh, I'm not able to provide too many that kind of uh, good examples. When using single sign-on services in Europe, uh, we are mainly using Google, Facebook or, or Apple to get access to those services. Even our remote uh, uh, voting system in the parliament is not based on single digital identities guaranteed by the government. I will be really happy when we be able to get cross-border access uh, to all kinds of digital services provided in different EU member states. That's why uh, all the member states have to have user-friendly digital identification systems. And that's why we also have to improve our eIDAS system. Looking forward to have fruitful debate. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for setting the scene so well and for sharing the very interesting example of uh, e-Estonia. And as you said, it's, uh, it's clear that there's still a long way to go uh, for the cross-border uh, authentication and identification. So, but let's hear from the European Commission. Let's uh, uh, hear from uh, uh, Lorena. What's the state of play? Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, always a pleasure to uh, to see again, uh, we miss you. <laughs> um, this, listen, this is a, a, an interesting um, subject and an interesting moment for, for the Commission to be invited to this uh, to this event because um, uh, we are in the in the situation where we have um, received a political mandate, and this is quite exceptional because uh, uh, it, it's not every day that you have a mandate uh, first from your president uh, our our president uh, uh, committed uh, to uh, to secure a european digital ID identity and really mention what he wanted uh, one that we trust and that any citizen can use anywhere in europe to do anything from paying your taxes to renting a bicycle a technology where we can control ourselves, what data and how data is used. So we have a, a clear political mandate from her side, but we also have a political mandate uh, from the European uh, Council that asked the Commission uh, to develop a, a, a new wide framework for secure public electronic identification. So 
uh, you will tell me this is a luxury. You, you, you know what you have to do. Of course, now uh, we need to translate uh, this political mandate into, into a proposal. Um, I, I hope you will not be disappointed that I will, don't tell you what will be the proposal, but it doesn't exist yet, so we don't know. Uh, what I can do is to somehow go through what is the context in which we, uh, commission will need to come uh, with this proposal so that you can see what are the, the challenges uh, and the issues at stake. Uh, of course, our starting point, uh, as, as, as Mr. Ansi was, was rightly saying, is that we have today uh, a legal framework, the, the EIDAS regulation. And I think that we have to start with, with kind words to this, uh, to this piece of legislation. Uh, it, it, it established for the first time uh, a kind of interoperability framework uh, and a trust model that is capable or has the potential to, to create uh, collective confidence in, in the security of national EID systems. Um, uh, we also uh, created a, a regulated market for trust services that Okay, seems to uh, work. Of course, we can uh, always uh, improve. Uh, but for the EID uh, part of the EIDAS regulation, uh, clearly um, there is scope for improvement. Um, today, uh, there are only 14 member states that have uh, notified uh, an EID. And to have mu the mutual recognition that Mr. Ansi was uh, asking for, we need for this system to be uh, notified and, and go through 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 the mutual recognition process. Uh, uh, of them, uh, only seven are mobile based. Of course, uh, the Estonian one is is, is one of, of them, uh, always first in class. Uh, um, but we only have that. So so you see. Uh, then it's not only that we have only forty member states that have notified uh, nineteen uh, schemes. Uh, is that then they need to be used. Uh, today, as, as we know, um, the IDAS is focusing on the public uh, sector. Uh, and of course, there are many more uh, use cases. Um, uh, but even for those uh, systems that have been notified, uh, uh, it doesn't always mean that it is working. It's because you need to connect uh, the, the, the systems uh, and today uh, there is a lot of scope, scope for, for improvement. Uh, the, the, the numbers of, of, of usage are, 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 are certainly very far from meeting the expectations that our political masters are, are asking us. So um, a lot of uh, improvement needed. So, we need now to, to, to come with a, a new proposal. And uh, what is, uh, this is what is the situation as regards what we have, but the market of course has moved on as, 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 uh, as um, Andrews was, was saying. Uh, and what has changed? Well, on the, on the demand side, what we see is that it is driven by, by different uh, requests, some, are asking for a user friendliness, something that is easy to be used. Uh, others are asking for, for security. No, I, I really need uh, to be sure of what is happening with my data or the type of service I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to access. It is something where I need to be, uh, that needs to be trusted. Uh, sometimes it's, it's regulatory compliance. So there are all these, uh, mm, uh, issues driving demand, uh, user friendliness, uh, trustworthiness, uh, sometimes regulatory compliance. And what is on the off on the on the supply side? We have, as I was saying before, uh, the official government EIDs, whether they are notified or not, uh, that normally provide a high level of, of assurance, uh, um, but that are mostly used for public services. Um, then you have uh, on the market, uh, of course, some solutions provided uh, to a large extent by, by social media that are very convenient, that are rather um, responding to this user friendliness. Uh, uh, these are, uh, you know, what we call the, the sign on uh, system where you are, uh, use an existing uh, social media to, to authenticate yourself. Uh, then we have uh, 
some of these, by the way, some of these uh, uh, big players are also providing at least in connection with payment services uh, solutions that are, are more, more secure. Then you have other players like the banks uh, that are providing uh, also uh, digital identity proofing. They are considered also quite secure for those that are looking for this security. Uh, but in most of the cases, uh, in most of Europe, they are providing only the services to their own customers. You have in the Nordic countries, in the Nordic countries, uh, these providers also providing to, to, to other type of users. Uh, uh, so this is a development. Uh, then you have, and I'm sure that we will hear much more about this, uh, the mobile network operators that have uh, uh, are offering whether SIM cards or we have, of course, the GSMA uh, Mobile Connect uh, uh, developing. Uh, and then you have companies that are specialized in providing uh, digital identity. Normally, uh, they are working or often for, for the government or on behalf of the government. Uh, and then you have all the type of providers that are, um, that are uh, emerging, which is what we call derived identity providers because you as a user you may need to use for a specific case your official id but maybe you need only to use a credential or an attribute uh, uh, of a part of your identity let's say i want to buy uh, alcohol online i want simply to prove that i'm over 18 without any need to provide more data so uh, you may have services developing that provide only parts or that provide credentials about, I don't know, uh, your fishing license or something like that. So you see all these developments on, on the market that are fulfilling different needs. Uh, um, and this is, let's say, <laughs> the market that we have in front of us when drafting the, the, the legislative proposal. Now, what we take from this, from the mandate of the political masters and from what we see uh, is a mandate to create a framework that allows the citizens to be able to exercise the, the, their citizenship uh, rights across borders. Uh, uh, and for that, it will be necessary that they have an availability of, of, of um, identity solutions that are able to respond to the maximum of use cases possible. So not only the public service cross-border, but also of private uses. Uh, uh, and also very important, as I was saying, that, that the user is at the center of controlling the data that he or she is, is releasing and that is user-friendly. Now, you will tell me, how do we put all this together? This is a challenge uh, we have today. Okay? As I was saying, there is a system of official IDs that uh, probably needs improvement, uh, and there are other developments in the market that are not regulated at EU level. So we uh, will take all these uh, different elements and try to come with a proposal that uh, meets the, the request of, the, of, of our political masters. And I, I will leave it there, happy then to reply to questions. Thank you very much uh, and thanks for, for being with us and for sharing uh, your views, of course, even if uh, the, the proposal, as you said, is not there yet, but it is clear that the potential is there, but so are the challenges to uh, make uh, this a reality and meet the political expectations as well. But let's now uh, hear from some of the players on the market, uh, starting with uh, Oliver Bartno with Cybernetica. Over to you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for, uh, for the invitation to, uh, to speak at this uh, honorable event. Um, I am um, Oliver Vartno, and I present an IT company uh, that um, uh, comes from Estonia and that has done a lot, of, uh, a lot of the work here in Estonia on the digital identity ecosystem. Um, but I'm not going to talk about Estonia too much. Uh, rather, I would like to maybe discuss on three uh, key issues. Uh, first of all, about the benefits of an electronic identity ecosystem. Secondly, um, about the competition and the landscape uh, that we have in Europe, but also globally 
uh, in the in the electronic identity domain and thirdly uh, maybe a little bit about technology as well and what are the kind of key characteristics that we uh, that we need to uh, that we need to address when uh, when deploying a, a secure digital identity in Europe so first of all, first of all about the benefits um, uh, it is quite obvious um, that um, uh, one cannot really offer any uh, digital services or any services on the cyberspace without a strong digital identity. Um, when we have deployed, uh, when, when we look at the story of the Estonian e-government or when where we have deployed our technologies, Estonian technologies to other countries, we always uh, or we mostly start uh, with the issue of digital identity. How can we authenticate people in the cyberspace in order to offer them services? Everything, all, uh, all services, public services are connected uh, to this strong digital identity. Think about electronic voting. One cannot vote uh, online when, when you really don't know who's behind the identity that is voting. How can one offer uh, social security benefits online without uh, identifying a, a person online? But also bear in mind uh, the fact that actually um, a citizen on average uh, interacts with the government maybe twice a year, maybe three times a year, maybe four times a year. But mostly uh, a citizen actually talks to the private sector uh, to by accessing its um, banking, online banking system or telco system or paying electricity bills, etc., etc. So it is really key actually to enable uh, also private sector to be part of that uh, part of that formula. Andros, uh, Mr. Einzip uh, mentioned uh, that Estonia has um, saved 2% of GDP uh, because of the fact that we have a digital identity. We don't have uh, uh, trolleys going around uh, with contracts uh, between companies, when I when I sign something, when I win a procurement here in Estonia, I do everything online. There is a huge um, there is a huge societal benefit because of that. And finally, let's not for forget about the COVID crisis. We have been in lockdowns in Europe, uh, but we need to offer services. We need to reach uh, our people when they are home and digital services is definitely the best way uh, reaching these people, providing them um, the services that are needed. A little bit about competition and landscape. Um, Mr. Einzip also mentioned that the competition is fierce. Um, there is a huge push actually to use Facebook, Google, Microsoft authentication technologies or Adobe's digital signature technologies. Um, why? Because they're widespread and they're convenient. Europe is really kind of lagging behind. Um, and soon I fear that we will be in a situation where we have with our cloud technologies today. Europe doesn't have a cloud offering. Uh, Commission is putting together something like uh, Gaia X with member states, but we are about five, ten years late actually doing that. And I think in, in the domain of digital identity, we have this momentum and we have to use this momentum. Also, um, European digital identity, we have, it's, a, it's a very, very challenging task. Bear in mind, Estonia doesn't want a European digital identity. Estonia has its own digital identity. So how we can bridge all these identities together how we can make them interact together so that uh, so that all interests are covered. Um, this is a hugely challenging task that the European Commission uh, should lay, should lead and 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 really provide a solution that takes care of all the interests. Finally, about technology, a couple of observations. We have actually quite good ecosystems in Europe that are working. Leaving Estonia aside, we have 
uh, bank ID in Scandinavia, we have uh, uh, digital identity in Denmark, uh, we have something in Portugal, Germany, etc., etc. My message is that we should actually study these ecosystems that work, uh, that work, and and basically take the lessons learned from there and try to replicate these around Europe. We have we have existing technologies that work very very well. We don't need another European Horizon project that tries to in, invent a new uh, electronic identity technology. I think we have we have enough. We have to we have to choose and 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 really you know go behind one or two technologies and really endorse them in in Europe. In regards to ADAS, ADAS directive is. Um, is very or is mostly uh, public sector specific and very certification heavy. Bearing in mind that there are problems with certification, there are costs with certification, certification doesn't always bring security. Um, but we have to look at also, I think, the wider scope of the electronic identity ecosystem, uh, meaning enrollment in the electronic identity scheme and also how do we engage with the private sector? How do we actually get that private sector pull in order to, to, um, to implement the digital identity? And finally, issues like, when we look at technology, issues like privacy, convenience, transparency, control, security. We have to find a balance in all of these things. Privacy on what kind of credentials are shared, convenience is number one. Uh, when we talk about the take up of the technology, transparency or what this technology really means, control that it has to be behind or be, uh, under the control of the individual and of course security that um, is the fundament of, of a digital identity. We have studied these in Estonia. We have our own split key smart ID solutions. We have uh, uh, electronic identity card solutions, SIM card solutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This ecosystem needs to be strong. And finally, my point is business models. Let's let's not forget about business models. In in a lot of cases where we have seen the failure of uh, digital identities because of the of the failure of the business models. Let's open a debate on what is a successful business model on a digital identity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver, for presenting the benefits, but also the many barriers uh, to the uh, EID uh, systems and uh, to uh, review a bit what's uh, already out there. Uh, it's clear that uh, your suggestion is to look at uh, the uh, ecosystems that are already there and that are working uh, without reinventing the wheel. But let's uh, uh, hear now from uh, the industry uh, with Philippe Lucas with Orange. Your microphone, Philippe, please. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I would like to thank uh, also Andrus Ansip, member of the European Parliament and the European Internet Forum for inviting me and Orange to participate to this uh, event today. I'm especially uh, honored uh, to be speaking with uh, Mr. Andrus uh, Ansip and Lorena uh, from the European Commission and members of the uh, EIF as we share, I believe, uh, a common value to make Europe a world leader in information and communication technology, including, of course, the capacity to have um, digital ID solutions that I will try to give you, I would say, some hints on our vision on what could be done. Orange, uh, our purpose is to connect our 256 million customers with digital devices and services, not only mobile, but mostly mobile. Uh, and our guiding principles has always been to build trust of our brand in the 26 markets we are operating in worldwide, uh, Europe and Africa and Middle East. I'm here today to share our vision on a common global standard on digital identification called Secure Application for Mobile that has been uh, started to be developed by the GSM Association uh, with mobile operators. That is an expansion of what we start doing with SIM and eSIM. And we believe that, that can be fuel, fueling the uh, growth of opportunities for European citizens to access secure mobile digital services and contribute to the EU digital sovereignty. And for us, this is one of the extremely important elements that is, was just described right before. 
we are convinced that um, the digital world that we are entering more and more, that we are using more and more, will need, and I will say needs, not only will, but needs a digital identity solution. And I would be more explicit, digital identities framework. As it was mentioned, it can be public and private. And the question is, what pro proposition solutions can be done? We believe also that the smartphone will be at the core of this evolution, as it is now for most of our services. And interestingly, the mobile industry has developed a, an existing solution, the SIM, that you are all using. This SIM is evolving to an eSIM solution, which will be stored in your device, sorted, so you cannot remove it anymore. And this eSIM, which is already starting to be used on, on recent phones and smartphones from Apple and Samsung, are, is also usable on your cellular watches, for instance. This SIM, what it is? It is a safe in which one mobile operator can store its secret to enter its network. An eSIM is a SIM with another characteristic, which is that I can store more than one operator in it and having its secrets stored side by side to the different operators in the same secure element, which is called now an eSIM. And gradually, when you start pulling the string, you understand very quickly that you can start making this eSIM evolving to something a bit new, very largely more, more broader than just the telecom and mobile industry, to say, instead of having mobile operators side by side, we could imagine that we could have secrets or credentials from various vertical sectors side by side. And this, is, this evolution is developed by the GSMA, in which Orange is taking a, a strong place and trying to develop this solution. And this solution is called a SAM, Secured Applications for Mobile. Today, as it was mentioned by Oliver right before, and also Andres and Lorena, there is a risk of fragmentation. As our society is becoming increasingly digitalized, identity solutions remain fragmented in an increasing number of players, sometimes dominant, with their own proprietary solutions, as it was just rightly said before. And there is a real risk that for EU players to lose ground on the development of secure mobile identity services, where we believe we have a leadership to gain and to remain and to keep. There is also a risk of dependence of member states on identification systems not defined by the EU. To keep sovereignty of member states, we need a neutral solution from all the players to avoid a dominant position on digital identity management that could be managed by non-European entities. One of the elements I wanted to explain before could be typically your public digital identity, and today this is typically done in passport and digital ID, and this is under the responsibility of member states, and we believe that should, re that should remain under the responsibility of member states, and such a proposition and such a solution allows it to make it happen. So how do we plan to solve this? And I'm ready to open up for questions, of course. Uh, we believe that the revision of the EIDAS is now at a timely point to implement and deploy this ambitious open standard on a digital identity solution and boost the European digital market. Orange, together with our partners and the GSMA, which represents the interest of mobile network operators worldwide, have developed this open standard called SAM, Secure, Secured Applications for Mobile, for short, uh, which is able to bring any EIDAS digital identity solution into a smartphone. It's an open solution to securely host sensitive data in the hardware element, and the hardware element is called a secure element of a smartphone, like the SIM card is a secure element. It is this very sensitive elements, very sensitive elements can be securely stored in it, like your SIM card for your smartphone or your credit card for your bank account, 
which is using exactly the same type of technology, or your new passport for the people who have this electronic passport elements on your passport, which is using also the same type of digital, sorry, hardware secure element with NFC coupled with an NFC solution when you need to have it. And so all your elements are stored in exactly the same type of secure element. And we believe this could be fitting in one single secure element in your mobile tomorrow, but we need to have a framework that will allow all these things to work the right way to avoid the dominance of a single player. This bank vault, it's this sum is like a bank vault or a safe for digital identity storage, which is free from dependency on specific actors and under the control of EU law and values. And it's even not under the control of the operators, of course. That's something which is much broader than us. But there is more to this standard that meets UBI. This safe is a safe of safes, where each digital identity element is stored in its own cryptographic little safe, which is isolated from the other safes. Remember the eSIM with the different mobile operators side by side? It's the same concept. But instead of having different mobile operators, you will have your credentials for your operator or operators, your credentials for your bank, your credentials for your transport, your credentials for your digital public ID as a citizen. If you want to vote, if you want to be, if you want to know if you have 18 years old to buy the bottle of whiskey that Lorena was mentioning earlier on. This solution is user friendly and easily allowing only the end user to manage their SAM-based identities for enrollment, installation, and deletion, ensuring data protection and privacy in line with, in line with GDPR, as it was mentioned and done by the European Commission. This proposition aims at offering a hosting solution allowing the deployment of EIDI services on mobile in an interoperable way and accessible to any accredited services provider government or private, as it was mentioned right before, using only standardized open interfaces and secure digital certificates. The standard bill with Europe in mind is developed with multiple private vertical sectors, such as banking, transportation, and even government, should they wish to use it, who have their own prerogative on identity provided to the citizen to their country, as I was mentioning right before. There is no intention that mobile operators are managing such a solution for all the vertical sectors at all. We are taking care of our own and that's enough. But we have in our hands a digital solution that matches all the needs of the vertical sectors that can be interested in an adequate configuration. In order to make this framework possible, the safe of safes, we need to ensure that the management of a key of a big safe is safe and is not controlled by one single operator or one single actor in the, in the industry. So that we need a framework and Europe can build this framework as we need a regional solution, at least by re region, I mean Europe, as we cannot rely on a single country to develop this as we are facing the smartphone industry, which is global. Without a European view, we will miss the scale needed to get the support of big mobile industry players. As Europe led GSM and the development of mobile, and it set the scenes on GDPR, at Orange, we believe our, our Europe can make a difference on such solutions as well, setting up the appropriate framework to make it a reality. Using and promoting open standards, following European requirements as EIDAS revision will allow us to do, we have a unique opportunity to define the right future of digital identity and identities of our future lives. This open standard should be led by Europe, for Europe at least, and to the benefit of our 27 member states and likely to expand worldwide afterwards, as we did for previous solutions. Adopting an open standard approach for digital identification on mobile will not only accelerate the digitalization of Europe, but it will bring also four advantages to Europe as paper-based identities dematerialized, this will encourage the growth of digital citizenship, as in Estonia, uh, as access to public services will be driven by more mobility and greater access to innovative services, also from public private sector as well. EU citizens will be able to leverage the potential of their digital economy with increased trust and services in a growing digital world, 
with great security. Cyber security defenses with certified security solutions will meet the expectations of nation, national and European public authorities, which in turn increases great, greater trust. And finally, digital sovereignty on identification will give Europe a first time lead to deploy its services without dependency on services and specific actors with closed solutions that pose a risk of EU digital sovereignty. So we need to be strong inside Europe. Uh, and we do hope to be able to, con to contribute to it. If we are to convince the rest of the world that Europe is right to be going, to, to be going down this path. So this plan cannot start tomorrow. We believe that it, uh, tomorrow will be too late already. Uh, next year, definitely new actors and actors will have already started things and will have already uh, been going ahead. So we need to start today with a bold plan to create a Europe first for mobile digital identification. And we believe that SAM is very likely one of the solutions described by Oliver before that could help us reaching that goal. So SAM is independent from any type of actor and puts privacy compliant and user friendliness by design at the forefront on all the smartphone in the European Union and hopefully worldwide afterwards. In a world, changing innovation that will make Europe a world leader in digital identification free from dominant actors. Where trust is paramount, we must be open. Where privacy is needed, we must enforce it. And Europe can lead the way on digital identity using open standard technology proposed by Orange and GSMA with all the vertical actors supporting this common goal. Secured applications for mobile must be driven by Europe for Europe to bring Europe even closer together as we begin our journey to bring a safe and secure digital identification solution on mobile for use in the European single market. Thank you very much. A clear call for action, uh, Philip. Thank you very much for presenting the various mobile solutions for uh, e-identification offered by Orange. Let's now uh, bring in our speaker from Bundesdruckerei, Patrick von Braunmüll. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here and uh, good afternoon. I'll just try to um, share my screen here just a second. Um, here it should be. Okay, is that to be seen? Good. Um, so I'll just start. Um, as has been uh, pointed out by the speakers uh, before, especially by Lorena, um, we, we have a lot of uh, political uh, attention uh, now and a political mandate to develop this European framework for digital identities. Um, this is very timely uh, because there is a sense of urgency. Yeah? And as Philip uh, has just mentioned, the window of opportunity to create this framework um, is, is narrow and we have to, uh, to move quickly. Um, I would like to present you some um, experiences from uh, Germany, um, although I know that Germany has not necessarily been known to be a front runner in uh, digital government and uh, digital identities. But at the moment, uh, I can tell you that there is a lot um, happening uh, indeed. And um, actually, this, uh, this project Optimus 2.0, which was funded by the German government, goes in a, in a very similar direction as the, the project which was presented by, by Philipp from, from Orange, uh, because it is clear to us that um, digital identities um, have to be mobile. Yeah? And, but, the, but the question is, how can, you, um, uh, how can you provide for secure identities on the mobile phone? And so um, what we did uh, in, the, in the context of the Optimus project uh, is also use those um, secure hardware elements in the phone. And I mean, there, is, there, there are different possibilities. The eSIM mentioned by Philip is one possibility, but there are also mobile phones with embedded secure elements, um, uh, which have to, which if they are opened for, for, for governments and other, other players, uh, they can be used to, uh, to store those uh, credentials and keys and, and sensitive personal information. Um, and and um, and and applets, so uh, that the user really has the full control that it is um, 
uh, in line with uh, with data protection and that it can fulfill um, an EIDAS trust level high. Although I believe that the, the, the trust levels in EIDAS have to be perhaps redefined in uh, 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 for uh, for the mobile area, um, but it is important that you that you have this possibility. So um, uh, basically, um, we uh, uh, we have tested uh, with other players uh, a number um, of uh, different uh, use cases, which you, which you see here. And very importantly, the German government uh, plans to bring the uh, mobile EID uh, out towards the end of this year. Um, based on this um, uh, 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 technology or, or standard. Um, here you can see the partners which have been um, um, on board. Uh, you see a lot of uh, German but also international uh, companies. Uh, Vodafone was on board, uh, Telefonica and uh, Samsung um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, is, is, is selling the, um, the first mobile phones which um, um, uh, where you which you can actually use to um, uh, with this embedded secure elements to uh, to store these these applications. Um, yeah, the, the strategic project goals were similar to those described before to supply technology for EID providers and enable them to offer mobile EID services at EIDAS level substantial or high. We believe it should be high. Uh, to offer service providers relying on a certain security level, a secure, privacy-friendly platform for mobile services, and to minimize barriers to entry for SMEs and startups by suitable technical and organizational provisions. And uh, let me highlight, because I think this is very uh, important, that this is also very well uh, corresponding with the uh, so-called uh, SSI ecosystem self sovereign identities where we already have international standards and in, in many countries in the EU um, uh, this approach is already used um, and um, but but also for SSI identities you have that um, uh, the challenge uh, where you store the, the local information on the phone so if you if you open the secure element um, um, that will provide security also for these uh, SSI uh, credentials. And um, I believe this should be a part of the EIDAS uh, proposal so that we can uh, actually rely on, on mobile phones for these uh, identities. Um, with this, yeah, I would like to come to the, to the, to the European framework, which we're all uh, awaiting in, um, in April. And... Um, I mean, there, there, there are a number of questions. I mean, I, be, I believe that uh, also, like others have mentioned, that the EU proposal should be a framework, it, not necessarily create uh, something new or separate EU ID, but we have the uh, the national EIDs, yeah, which which should become uh, mobile. We need this mobile ecosystem, um, and um, and it would be very useful to. Uh, if the if the regulation can provide for an opening of secure elements on um, uh, mobile devices and also create a framework for the, these um, uh, for a self sovereign identity uh, ecosystem um, then there's also the question between you know the the role of government and private sector we believe that the 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 national uh, identity is really something which governments should offer and it can also then be um, the national EIDs, they can be the, the root uh, ID also for other uh, private sector uh, applications and, and the SSI uh, ecosystem. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and, and finally, um, I would like to say that um, the, uh, we should also consider organizational IDs or identities of organizations where we already have some instruments in the uh, EIDAS regulation, like the, the SEALs and the so-called qualified website certificates. But what we have uh, seen, for instance, with these uh, website certificates is that they're not um, accepted by, uh, uh, by the browsers. And therefore, I think a part of the proposal should also be uh, to make sure that the, uh, these EIDAS instruments and identities are really uh, accepted by uh, by global players when they're acting in the European market. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for uh, telling us what's been currently developed in uh, Germany. And uh, it is clear that you share the sense of uh, urgency that uh, other speakers uh, shared before you. Uh, let's now bring in uh, our uh, last but not least uh, speaker, Coti de Monteverde with Santander. And uh, let's hear uh, her views uh, from uh, another player in the market. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Coti de Monteverde and I'm leading the Blockchain Center of Excellence of Santander. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in this session today. I feel honored for sharing the stage today with so relevant speakers. And um, I'm going to walk you through what is currently being developed in, in Spain in terms of digital identity by the private sector using blockchain. And in particular, I'm going to explain to you what is the Alastria ID standard and how we are using it in the Dalian Consortium. So let me share one moment my, my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? I guess, yes, right? So, so as I was saying, I'm going to introduce you first uh, what is the Alastria ID standard. And Alastria is the first national non-profit blockchain association in the world. It's multi-sector and has over 500 members from leading corporates and public institutions to SMEs and, well, it has built a public permission network that has more than 150 nodes uh, right now. Since its foundation, in order to achieve legally binding transactions in this network, Alastria's priority has been building a digital identity mechanism for individuals and corporates. And Santander is one of the founding members uh, of Alastria and is currently sponsoring the Digital Identity Commission, where we have collaborated in designing and developing the Alastria ID model. This model is based on the concept of self-sovereign identity that uh, that we've just heard about it, right? Uh, it's a decentralized model focused on the user who is the sole owner of his data and has full control over it. Blockchain is one of the alternatives to implement a self-sovereign identity solution, uh, but uh, uh, with uh, the use of this technology, we maximize transparency and, and security, um, two features that we've heard a lot today as well. So here, cryptography allows the possibility of signing and verifying the origin of the credentials without needing a third party. Uh, when registering in blockchain, the hashes of the credentials, as well as all the events regarding their issuance, presentation, and revocation, we are assuring that they cannot be altered, making it GDPR compliant and being completely user-centric. This system, as well, uh, does not need any third parties that act uh, that act as intermediaries and who can read or use uh, our personal data. So the most obvious benefit is privacy. And instead of having our critical pieces of personal information everywhere uh, stored at dozens, if not hundreds of different locations, the information remains with the individual. And the individual in this case is the only entity with the authorization to disclose or allow access to sensitive information and also controls the level and duration of external access. So, Alastria ID. This model uh, was designed by the Alastria Identity Commission in an open source format. It has been contributed by more than 200 members over the last two years. And in terms of uh, standards and regulation, this model has inspired the European Commission in the design of the European digital identity model called ESIF under uh, EFSI, the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure. It has been recently approved as a formal standard by the Spanish standardization body, it's called UNE, and it has also been elevated to other standardization organizations like the European CENELEC. It is compliant with EIDAS and it also follows the W33 standards regarding verifiable credentials and decentralized um, identifiers. So let me tell you um, how it works. So as you can see in this uh, diagram uh, in the Alastra ID model and therefore in the one uh, implemented by the Dalian project, there are three main actors that interact between each other. First, the citizens in the center that uh, manage their own data in a secure, reliable and transparent way using a mobile wallet. We've been talking about mobile phones for a while as well. So, as well. so it is also very important uh, for us the security of these devices, HSMs, SIMs that can be used uh, in our solution as well. 
So in this way, the user here can control his credentials and decide with what service providers they want to share them, with what purpose and for how long. Secondly, we have the issuers that are trusted entities that issue credentials about users. Credentials can contain any type of personal information from bank account numbers to university diplomas. Depending on the type of entity and the information provided, credentials have a level of assurance that it's aligned with EIDAS. Also, users can issue self-attested credentials that are la labeled with the lowest assurance uh, level. The third role is a service provider. In order to provide a service to the user, for example, car sharing, an entity can request the user to share his credentials, but always the user has to give his consent. These credentials are shared off-chain via secure communication channels, but its content is never stored in the blockchain. So no personal information is stored on the blockchain. What is being stored in the blockchain is the actions that are performed on those credentials, such as the issuance, the registration, the request of those credentials, and they are always encrypted using a double hash mechanism. So privacy and no traceability of the user activity is guaranteed. You can see in the diagram below, these are real hashes of credentials and it's impossible to know what they are talking about and they are not, um, there's no way to decipher them. Um, this model is also providing a one-click data revocation process, and that revocation is going uh, to be stored in, in the blockchain, so the user um, can prove that, that he asked for that revocation of the, of the data. And now, if we get to Dalion, the Dalion project, it is a collaborative project uh, that, has, uh, that was ideated by several members of Alastria with the aim of putting into practice the model that I have just uh, described. So Dalion complements the work performed in Alastria, adding new technical elements needed to operate, like the wallet and the necessary pieces to integrate business applications with the blockchain. Currently, we are nine companies of different sectors working together. In the coming days, we will be 10, and we are super open to welcome new members to join us and enrich our ecosystem. We also have the honor to count with observers from the Spanish public administration, as we believe that including both private and public sectors is a way to enable sufficient scale of adoption of a digital ID system. Our project started back in, in 2019. In July last year, we delivered a proof of concept that demonstrated its technical uh, viability. And now we are in the process of delivering a production grade MVP with the objective of piloting it, piloting it before summer. Um, I've brought some of the screens of a proof of concept that we perform in order to show you how this would work in a very summarized uh, way. So in this example, a non-customer of Santander wants to ask for a consumer loan. This process traditionally requires verifying a lot of information and documents. Here we have a button saying, use Alastria ID. It would be included, so it would redirect the user to his identity wallet and would ask him to share certain credentials that have been previously validated by other entities. The user would give his consent for the bank accessing that information, making the process faster and simpler. Customers would benefit from a better user experience and companies would have more efficient onboarding uh, processes. So that's all from my side and I'm very happy to, to answer uh, any questions you might have uh, about uh, this standard and this project. Thank you very much for presenting the various uh, blockchain uh, solutions for uh, uh, digital identification where it seems that the uh, user would be very much at the center of the operations. Let's uh, indeed, as you said, Cody, move to the Q&A session where we can continue the conversation with an interactive exchange with the audience.